Um, I'm really glad you brought up Dennett because I really do agree with a lot of Dennett's formulations. Um, for example, uh, he enters into cognitive science and, and contributes um, a great deal of key insights, I think, because he's very anti-Cartesian. So he's against this idea that there is this mind or consciousness separate from the body or the physical material world, which I agree with because that, that fragments us. And when you have a fragmented view of reality like that, a fragmented ontology where there's the mind that's real inside here and then there's the world that's just as real outside here and yet one is free, the mind, and the other is determined. And so there's, at the heart of nature, there's this incongruity, this, this conflict. And the idea that there could possibly be a conflict, a true conflict at the heart of nature, seems um, strange to me. It doesn't seem like the simplest explanation which science so often looks for. It doesn't seem like the most elegant, beautiful um, uh, organization either. Um, so then I wants to get rid of that dualism, but I think in his rush to get rid of it, he settles for one half of the dualism that cannot make sense or exist and be coherent on its own. Um, naturalism sort of says only the third person external objective view of the world is real. When we all know we have an experience, we go to sleep at night and we have dreams and there's this subjective state of consciousness. And you can call it an illusion all you want. It's there. We have this experience, or this experience exists. To say that it's an experience had by a self, I guess, is another step. Um, which is another thing I really like about Dennett, is that he says, look, there's no self in the brain. Which, it's a lot easier to notice the fact that there's no self when you think about it as this third-person process that goes on without us having any say. It's just a collection of objects and parts working together in this machine designed by evolution, which is an ongoing process. This isn't a finished design. This is an ongoing development, which doesn't have an end goal as far as naturalism is concerned. Um, but that's a big problem in naturalist biology because life seems inherently goal-oriented. And yet, a goal seems to line up with that idea of a purpose. And so, to deal with this problem in biology, the basic notion is we can allow for one type of internal motivation or goal-seeking behavior in organisms, and that is to stay alive. Because it, it appears, at least on the surface, without thinking about it much, that we can just say, only organisms that want to survive have survived up to this point, so there's no gap in explanation there. But I don't think that there... By definition, the idea that an organism could exist that doesn't want to live doesn't seem very... I mean, you agreed, I agree people can be depressed, but animals in their natural ecosystem, do they get depressed and not want to live? I mean, not just the ones that have survived, but ever. Has there ever been an organism that came alive and that then wanted to die? Doesn't the fact that it's alive mean that it must want to be alive? But anyways, the subjective quality that, bio, that a naturalist biologist is willing to attribute to life, the only subjective quality is that survival instinct. Um, the libido is what Freud, Freud called it, because this is the same thing that drives human beings. Um, but one thing that Dennett said that really struck me was that there is this gap between clueless cells on the one hand, at the micro scale, and knowing organisms at the macro scale. And Hofstadter has the same basic dualism. He measures the soul based on how many symbols there are in the brain. And I guess he wasn't exactly clear about this in his book, that, The Strange Loop. Maybe he was in Go to Lesh Bach because it's huge and he must have mentioned it. But I, I don't know if he's so much into this idea that the brain and the mind, consciousness, the symbol processing program, um, is not just software that can be run on any hardware. It runs on neurons. And that's why I tend to go more, I lean more towards the embodied theories of cognition rather than the symbol processing theories because the symbol processing theories imply that we can have a mind anywhere, not just on this hardware, but on microchips. As long as the symbols are computed in the same way as they're computed up here, what's the difference what the medium of representation is? 
but the embodied um, cognitive scientists like uh, Varela and, and Maturana and um, Andy Clark, to some extent, Merleau Ponty was one of the early uh, philosophers of embodiment. Um, I'm reading a book right now by Mark Johnson and uh, George Lakoff that is really interesting because it, what it basically says is that uh, the whole Western tradition of philosophy, which includes naturalism, is assuming a lot of things a priori that we don't find empirically from our study of the world. And their idea of what rationality is, for instance, is uh, the, that our structures of rationality are formed by the motor and perceptual apparatus in our, in our brain. So we use the same neural structure to think about abstract problems as we do to walk through a room or play tennis or um, you know, regulate our, the motions of our bodies and the functions of our nervous system. And so rationality isn't this disembodied essence. The human mind doesn't know anything objectively. And the, the third person perspective is always a kind of hypothetical um, construct that we can never actually reach. Um, so to try to reduce everything to something that is nothing but a construct, though we can theorize all day that yes, it, uh, it exists, although we can never reach it. True. And we should investigate reality in such a way that we acknowledge that there is something there for us to discover and that we don't just create it. Because we don't just create it. It's also there for us to, to discover. The question is, can we ever um, retract all interference from the results that we're going to get back? You know, you perform an experiment, you're manipulating nature in such a way that in this contained environment that's set up exactly as you have designed it, sure, you can get nature to do some pretty fascinating things. And when you're building machines and you're, going, you're just going to repeat that laboratory condition in the machine, wherever the machine happens to be built, then it works. And we can build great technology out of that process of empirical investigation. But to say that we can know the world objectively is a step that I can't take, which is why I'm not a naturalist.